let me make sure you're, I'm understanding you, Matthew. They, they saw him crucified. They saw the tomb where he was laid. They had breakfast with him on the other side of the burial on a beach. They felt his hands. They felt his side. Several instances over a solid month. And some of them are still like, I don't, I don't know, man. Really, guys? And maybe that's what's going on. I'm not sure it is. That's one of the possibilities. You know what the other possibility is? One of them is that the doubt is in the one that they're worshiping. The other is that the doubt is in the ones doing the worship, the ones who had doubted him all along the way, the ones who had forsaken him and abandoned him and dishonored him when the pressure was on. They're doubting, looking back, their ability to do the thing that they realized he was inviting them to do. When you live there at the intersection between God's call and I can't, you are in perfect position to do something. Because God's not ever counting on your ability. He's looking for your availability. He is able to do what you're available for. Grab a Bible and meet me in Matthew 28. If you got a Bible today, if you got a hard copy like mine, it's about seven eighths of the way towards the back of uh, your Bible at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. You'll find Matthew 28. That's where we're going to be today and for the next couple of weeks. So find it, bookmark it, um, and I'll catch up with you in just a second. While you're finding uh, Matthew 28, let me just take a quick second to say it is so good to be back home. Uh, so good to be here with you, and thank you. So uh, yeah, many of you know this if you've been around Doxology for a while. Uh, if you're new to Doxology, uh, every year, sometime uh, during the summer, it kind of varies back and forth a little bit, uh, but you all have allowed us and allowed me and, and our elders expect me every summer to, uh, to stack a couple of weeks of family vacation with a couple of weeks of pretty intense uh, prayer and study. Uh, that last part, it's not, it's not sabbatical. I'm working during that last part, uh, working as hard as I ever work. Uh, I just don't have the, the Sunday morning freight train bearing down on me for uh, a few weeks. And that's an investment that uh, you all have seen fit to uh, put into us. And I'm really, really, really grateful for that. In some ways, um, I think it's hard to overestimate or overstate uh, what a value that is. I know to my family, uh, but I also believe to, to us as a church. Um, I just, I, I think uh, you experience better fruit off of a really deep watering, uh, and that's, that's important. Hopefully you experience that over time and, and feel like that's an investment in me that uh, turns out with a return on you as well as a part of our church. Um, but I'm absolutely aware every year what a gift that is to my family and to me as your pastor. So hear me say thank you uh, for that. Um, it was the second time in my life I've been to Yellowstone National Park. So part of that uh, family vacation time, uh, we went with my extended family to Yellowstone National Park. And um, second time that I've been, I'm not a prophet, uh, but I think I would tell you that uh, maybe two things. One, I, I think if you're a follower of Jesus, it is God's will for you some point to visit Israel. Um, I, just at some point, I think, uh, to, to visit Israel is part of God's will for your life. If you are an American and you are a Christian, I think it is God's will for you to visit Yellowstone National Park. 
And uh, man, if you're paying attention, that's as close as I get to Christian nationalism around here. So mark that down. Here we go. If you're an American and a Christian, I think you ought to do that. Like, um, it is just hard not to worship while you're in Yellowstone. Um, it is hard not to be just overwhelmed, Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons, with the majesty and the glory of God, uh, and to sense and feel his nearness while you're there. Um, it, it's just a really, really cool experience. So, um, and, and also to be grateful for the one thing that politicians got right. Like to carve out and protect that land, uh, it is awesome. So uh, grateful for the chance to do that with family. And then for the study time, spent a bunch of time here in Matthew 28. And then a ton of time uh, reading through and studying through the life of Abraham for a series we're going to do in the fall here uh, before too long. Uh, hopefully your groups are going to be a part of uh, some new neighborhood groups starting up. Uh, consider that if you don't have a group in your neighborhood. Uh, doing this with some neighbors, looking through the life of a guy who trusted God to live towards a promise. What it looks like to live that way. Um, really, really exciting excited about that series coming up. So be thinking about that, excited about that. But um, all of that to say thank you. Uh, thanks to you. Thanks to our elders. Uh, thanks to Chauncey and to Jay and uh, to Sam for going home run derby over the last several weeks. That's one of my favorite things about this time uh, is that I just know when I'm able to, to get away, I'm going to leave you in good hands, and in some cases in hands that are going to do a better job on topics and passages than I would. And that's not false humility. I genuinely believe that. It is so important for us. It's important for you to hear a, a shepherd's voice. It's also important for you to hear from other voices uh, with different styles and different experiences and backgrounds and to get a regular steady diet of that. So grateful for those guys doing that and uh, for you for allowing us to do that. Uh, so Oh, that's me. Uh, how are you guys doing? We, we good? All right, you find Matthew 28. That's where we're going to be today. Matthew 28. So contrary to what you may assume, uh, believe it or not, I was not a self-parenting child growing up. Uh, so sorry if that disappoints you or surprises you, uh, shocks you. I was not necessarily a bad kid, uh, but let's just say that most, uh, especially as a teenager, most of my parents' fears were not completely unfounded. But there was one thing that my parents were dead set that I not do that they never had to worry about me doing as a teenager. They never, ever, my parents never had to worry about me showing up with a tattoo at home. And I, now, I realize um, I am one of prob probably maybe the only person in our whole church under the age of 45 that doesn't have any ink anywhere on my body. Uh, and that, 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 I think that's okay. Um, I think that's great. It means something now than even it did 15 or 20 years ago. And especially in the house that I grew up with, the mom and dad that God gave me, uh, it, for them, in their world, a tattoo only ever meant one thing. And that was rebellion. Yeah? Uh, I know for, for a lot of you, uh, a lot of you that have ink, um, it's the exact opposite of that is the reason that you have that. And that's sort of the point uh, that I'm going to make here in just a second. That's kind of where I'm going. Uh, there is always a story behind ink. In fact, if you ever want to get to know somebody uh, and you want to get to go deep into somebody's story and get to know a little more about them, a server at a restaurant or somebody that you meet for the very first time, ask them, if you see ink on their body, ask them the story of the ink. You're going to hear a story about something that's really, really important to them. Now, sometimes... And this may be true of some of you. Sometimes the story that the ink tells is a story of rebellion. You know, a lot of people walking around with a tramp stamp, that's the story, yeah? A story of rebellion. If that offends you, you're going to hate our church. There is always a story. It doesn't always mean rebellion, but it always means something. Most often in our world today, isn't it true, that it's a story about something that's important to us. A story about something that someone has overcome. A story about something or someone that somebody wants to remember. Something that's true of them. Something that's important to them. Something that they aspire to. When you choose to be permanently marked, there's always a reason. And there's always a reason behind the mark you choose. Something so significant to you, so core to your unique story that you want to make it visible right there on the surface so that you see it every day. You can't forget it. And so that other people can see it too. So that got me thinking. And with all of the differences among us, and there are a lot of differences among us, 
all of the different backgrounds and perspectives and weaknesses and strengths and passions, the uniqueness of our stories, and we celebrate those at doxology. We promote those. We want to protect those differences at doxology. With all of those things that are different about us, are there certain qualities that are so significant to people who follow Jesus, certain characteristics that are so central to who we are, what we are about, that in one way or another, they ought to mark us, all of us, with or without ink. Things that Jesus expects to show up on the surface of our life so that we can't forget them. So that they show for other people to see. That's what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks together. If you've been uh, uh, around following Jesus for very long, you know this passage, Matthew 28. It's probably familiar to you. And you should just always know if a a passage is familiar to you, uh, that also makes it dangerous because we can find ourselves just skimming and no longer seeing what it says. So try to look at it with fresh eyes if it's familiar to you. It's one of Jesus' final recorded conversations with the people that have followed him around for the better part of three and a half years. Look at Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples, Judas is off the map at this point, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain, now notice this, where Jesus had told them to go. So maybe you're aware of this. Um, After Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to the men and women who had followed him for those three and a half years at least 11 times that we know about. One time he shows up in a garden. One time he shows up on the road, interrupts a person's walk. One time he walks through a a locked room, walks through the door. One time he shows up with breakfast on the beach. Of those 11 times and any others that there were, this is the only one that we know about that Jesus scheduled an appointment for. That has to be important, right? And they knew it. This was not a passing comment, what Jesus is about to do or say. Not just a, a reaction or response to some situation in their life. Jesus calls a meeting to give what it turns out are going to be his final words to them before he ascends to heaven. One of the hardest, um, holiest things that I get to be involved in as a pastor, that on multiple different occasions, I get invited into the room as people are saying or preparing to say what it turns out will be their last words. Without being there, if you've never experienced that, even without being there, you can probably imagine this. When a person knows that the words that they're about to say are going to be their last words, for the person saying them and for the person that is about to hear them, they're just weighed down with significance. Or when you don't know that they're the last words and you look back and realize they were the last words, suddenly they mean infinitely more than they meant even in the moment, right? They're chosen carefully, they're listened to intently, and they're remembered as something that has extreme significance in somebody's life. So when Jesus schedules this appointment with his disciples, and they look back on it and realize these are the last words that Jesus gave to us before he ascended up into heaven, what do you think was running through their hearts and their heads in the moment? Well, they tell us. Matthew was there. He tells us. There in the Bible next to verse 17, write the word posture. Posture. Look what it says. Matthew 28, verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. So two things there. They worshipped him, some doubted. Does one of those surprise you a little bit? One of the unique things about something that's familiar like this, uh, something I think is interesting, this is one of those places, the thing we take for granted is the thing that would have blown them away. And the thing that blew them away doesn't really surprise us at all when we read it. So it says here, they worshiped him. We kind of expect that, don't we? This is the part when Matthew's audience read it, it totally would have messed them up. Because Matthew's making it clear who they believe Jesus is in this moment. Jesus is not just another guy. He's not just a good religious teacher. They don't believe that Jesus is, is just a good moral authority or a religious leader. They believe that Jesus is the one true God in human flesh who conquered death, who created life, and who deserves their worship. 
They worship him there, and he lets them. That's where this whole thing starts for them. That's where it's got to start with us when it comes to following him. They worshiped. They worshiped, but some doubted. Matthew's audience would have gone, oh, that's more like it. Of course they did. We don't. We're like, hang on, they, they what? Let me make sure you're, I'm understanding you, Matthew. They, they saw him crucified. They saw the tomb where he was laid. They had breakfast with him on the other side of the burial on a beach. They felt his hands. They felt his side. Several instances over a solid month. And some of them are still like, I don't, I don't know, man. You read that, aren't you like, really, guys? And maybe that's what's going on. I'm not sure it is. That's one of the possibilities. You know what the other possibility is? One of them is that the doubt is in the one that they're worshiping. The other is that the doubt is in the ones doing the worship. The ones who had denied him less than a month ago. The ones who had doubted him all along the way. The ones who had forsaken him and abandoned him and dishonored him when the pressure was on. They're doubting, looking back, their ability to do the thing that they realized he was inviting them to do. I don't know about you, that, that really encourages me. They are realistic about who he is. They worshiped. And they are realistic, realistic about who they are. They are hesitant. That's the perfect recipe for God to do something significant, isn't it? That's their posture. Jesus is worthy of all of my worship. And left to myself, I'm going to screw up whatever he asked me to do. When you live there at the intersection between God's call and I can't, you are in perfect position to do something that's extraordinary in you and through you. Because God's not ever counting on your ability. He's looking for your availability. He is able to do what you're available for. Whether that's blessing a neighbor, whether that's killing a habit, meeting a need, establishing a rhythm, taking a step, if you ever sense that the God of the universe is calling you or inviting you to something and your first reaction is doubt or hesitation, if you will discipline yourself to worship in a posture that says, like, I don't have the ability, but follows it up with, but God, you have my availability, I promise you, you will find yourself in some situations that defy all natural explanation in that place between God's call and I can't. That's where it starts for these disciples. And because that's their posture in this moment, Jesus meets them at that intersection. Look at verse 18. Jesus begins to speak. The very first thing he says, all Authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. They're right there next to that verse, if you're writing in your Bible, write the word power. Power. Jesus says, all those things you're hesitant about, your ability, like the strength that you have to pull this off, the current, the pull of the world around you and the culture around you, your past, your current position in life, your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your anxieties, your struggles, your brokenness, your wounds, all of it, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. So pause there for just a second. How much authority has been given to Jesus? You know what the Greek word for all means? Yeah, all. <laughs> all authority. Okay, so for some of us, this is the sermon today. Are you tracking with me? What if in the middle of a messed up world where we live, 
we decided to wake up every single morning with this declaration on our mind and decided to live as if it was true. Our collective angst about politics, our anger at whatever corrupt social agenda is in vogue this year, look, all of that's real. In some cases, that's significant. It's scary. Not saying to dismiss it. What if we met it with this reminder, this declaration? Jesus says, all authority is mine. What about not just out there? What about in here? How serious would you get about that habit that you've been hiding if you believe that was true? What about that, that next step that you've been avoiding or ignoring out of fear of what people would think about you or what they would do to you? The thing that feels too big for you, what would you do with that if you believe this? If you are in Christ, Jesus says you can hang every hesitation on this declaration. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. Because of who he is, that's the best news possible. Whatever the rest of your day looks like, yeah? So you, you see their posture, you see his power. In light of that, what's the plan? They're next to verse 19, right? The plan. And pay attention, the next word is therefore. So therefore is a summary word. So what Matthew is saying is, and what Jesus is saying, in light of your posture, in light of his power, when availability and his authority are a part of your story, Jesus says, here are the qualities that should mark you. Verse 19. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, maybe you know this passage is commonly called the Great Commission. We'll talk more about it, but think about even just that word, co-mission. The mission that Jesus is accomplishing in the world, he wants to accomplish in and with and through and together alongside his disciples. Co-mission. And also notice it's co-mission, not commissions, plural. There is one mission. There are multiple marks. There are four action words there. Only one of them is a command. The command is make disciples. All of the other words are marks of participation in the command. So we've got to ask ourselves, if Jesus commands us to make a disciple, what in the world is a disciple? Like if we're going to make it, we ought to kind of know what it is, huh? Actually, it's a word that shows up, disciple, in the New Testament 268 times. Far and away, other than the family language of brother and sister, it's the word that gets used to describe people who find their life in Christ. So just in contrast or comparison, the word Christian is used three times in the New Testament. It feels like we ought to pay attention to that, even in our language, yeah? In the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, you've got three groups of people that are encountering Jesus. You have the crowd, you have the disciples, and you have the enemies of Jesus, Crowd, disciples, enemies of Jesus. In our world today, we've sort of combined the first two groups into one group, and we call them Christians. That would have been a totally foreign concept to disciples. Okay, not saying you can't go to heaven when you die if you're not a disciple. I think you can. That wasn't the primary question the people that were living in the New Testament were asking. It wasn't what they concerned themselves with. Their question wasn't, are you going to heaven when you die? Their question is, are you following Jesus while you live? Are you a disciple? Here's the other thing uh, before we move on. Every time you see the word disciple in the New Testament, it's a noun. It's not a verb. It's something that you are, not something that you do, or something that is done to you or to someone by you. 
So sometimes we, we talk about discipling people. You know, I'm discipling someone or someone's discipling me. And usually when we say that, what we mean is somebody's meeting with us one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one and going over questions or content with us, you know, once a week or more often than that. And I'm for that kind of thing, totally for that kind of thing, involved in that kind of thing. Okay, we got to be careful with our language when it comes to that for, I think, two big reasons. The first one is when we use that language of he's discipling me, I'm discipling him, is that sometimes we shift the responsibility of our formation and development into the likeness of Jesus onto somebody else. So it's not me that's responsible for being formed in the image of Jesus. It's not him that's doing that work in me. It's your responsibility. You're discipling me, you know. I'm responsible for you if I'm discipling you. I think we've got to be careful with that. The New Testament doesn't ever have that idea. You're responsible for being formed into the image of Jesus. And he wants to do that work in you, through you, with you. First thing. The second thing I think is even maybe a bigger reason to avoid some of that language is that I think it can turn the wrong person into the rabbi. We're followers of Jesus. We're not followers of another person. Not following Jesus in a second degree it makes the wrong person, somebody other than Jesus, the rabbi. So if there's a discipleship paradigm in the gospel to our lives today that we're living out, none of us is Jesus in that analogy. We're all Peter or John or Bartholomew Matthew, Jesus is still Jesus. We're all encouraging each other and exhorting each other, trying to follow Jesus together. So, in Jesus' day, a disciple would be a person that found a rabbi and decided to do three things. They, they hoped for three things as a disciple of a rabbi. The first one is to learn from the rabbi. The second is to live with the rabbi. And the third one is to ultimately look like the rabbi. For his story to intersect with their story, for them to walk with him and live with him, to go to places that he go and watch what he did, for them to listen to his teaching and to put it into practice and ultimately to transform into the image of that rabbi so that they did the things that the rabbi did. In Jesus' day, that's what a disciple was. For his life with them, to mark them in every imaginable way. In what way? Well, that's where we're going to go over the next several weeks. Let me just show you really quickly. Think of the acronym MARCS, M-A-R-C-S. Robbie Gallaty came up with this. I wish I had. Uh, he did, so uh, we'll give him credit for that. MARCS, M-A-R-C-S. Uh, first thing that you see about a, a, a disciple, and we'll see it in this passage, is that a disciple is missional. Jesus said, go. Literally, as you are going, make disciples. Disciples live as they follow a rabbi who is living life on the move. He has a mission, and he's accomplishing it. Wherever they're placed, as they are going along the way, they intentionally live and share the good news of life with Jesus, just like Jesus did. Missional. Second thing is accountable. You see there, Jesus said, teaching them to obey. Notice he doesn't say teaching them to know. Notice he, he also doesn't say telling them to believe or even telling them to obey, teaching them to obey. Follower of Jesus allows themselves to be pushed and stretched and challenged and molded to learn to look more like Jesus in real tangible ways. Third, a, a disciple is reproducible. Reproducible. Jesus says, and, and this is the central command and the whole thing, make disciples. Follower of Jesus is directly involved in helping other people find and follow Jesus. Jesus, my expectation is as you follow me, because of the way you follow me, there are going to be other people that we can point to. We're following me because you followed me. Your life intersected with theirs. The fourth one is communal. It says we're baptized into the name of. What we're going to see when we get to there, disciples are part of a family. They live in community with other disciples in a way that reflects and reveals the family that they're a part of together. We're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks. It is a game changer when you realize what Jesus is inviting us into and begin to live like it's true. Finally, disciples spiritual. Jesus said, I will be with you. Disciple realizes they can't live this life in their own power, but they make it their aim to walk every single step, to live every single moment connected to the presence and the power of Jesus. 
to be covered, as the old statement was, to be covered in the desk of their rabbi. So five things, marks, M-A-R-C-S, if you will, that Jesus says will mark the life of every person who lives with him and learns from him and begins to look like him as they go. We're going to spend the next five weeks diving more deeply into each of them, but uh, before we get there, can I get a little personal with you? Christian, do those marks mark you? Is your life with Jesus a significant enough part of your story that those things have moved to the surface of your life so that you can't forget them and other people can see them? Or are you just going to heaven when you die? If you're not going to heaven when you die, I want you to go to heaven when you die. You can go to heaven when you die simply by receiving a gift that Jesus has already paid for. When he died on a cross to pay your penalty, he rose from the dead to prove it was accomplished, and he offers you forgiveness and his presence and his power and life with him forever and ever and ever, eternal life, and he offers it to you as a gift that costs you nothing. You can receive it right where you sit. It's as simple as telling him right where you are. Maybe something that sounds like this. Jesus, I've trusted lots of things, lots of people for my life forever, but none of them can die for me. None of them can pay my penalty. None of them can conquer death and offer life. And I'm trusting that you can, and I'm putting the weight of my eternity in you. The promise of the scripture is from that moment, you are a child of God and you have everlasting life. You're going to heaven when you die. Now, whether you're trusting him for the very first time this morning with that or you trusted him for eternal life 50 years ago, good news. He wants more for your life than just that between now and then. This story, that story is so significant. He wants it to mark you in permanent, visible ways and a totally unique way to you. We're going to spend the next five weeks looking at what those are together. And can I just ask you over the next five weeks, um, would you make it a commitment to make it to every one of those weeks? Now, I, I, I work hard every week. You know, I, I love it when you're here every single week. And I am realistic that for a whole lot of reasons, some of them good, some other reasons, that you may miss a week or two every couple of years, okay? <laughs> Think of it this way. If you're marked and you're missing letters, that's kind of a bad thing, yeah? So think about it. I went to school with a guy who played basketball at Oklahoma State named Jason Keep. This was his tattoo. Can you see it? It says Big Dady, D-A-D-Y. There are all kinds of Okie State jokes that are buried in that image right there. Um, and I'm here for all of them, listen, as long as you got the moral high ground when you make them. And to have the moral high ground, it means that you're not missing a letter when it comes to what you're marked with. How will you know? Well, you got to be here every week, I'll tell you. Here's our question for us this morning. That's something else I'm borrowing from Robbie Gallaty. He said it's just too powerful to leave it or to change it. Are you willing to make Jesus' final words your first work? Are you willing to make Jesus' final words your first work? Like of all the words that Jesus could have said, all of the things that he could have chosen for his final words, the one with all authority in heaven and on earth commanded, commissioned us to join him in his mission of being and finding and developing people who receive life from him. Learn to live life with him and transform to look like him wherever we go. He's not asking you, can you? He's simply asking, will you? He's not concerned about your ability. You can't. The question's about your availability. He can if you're willing. Are you willing if he will? See, and here's the thing. If you consider yourself a Christian, but these things don't mark your life, you're left with a question. And it's not just a question of shame. There's also an invitation with it. But the question is this. If these things don't mark your life, whose disciple are you? 
See, the truth is, all of us are following someone or something. All of us. Now, I know uh, some of you, like, resist that. You know, you're punk rock, indie style, who doesn't follow anyone, just like all of the other punk rock, indie style people that don't follow anybody that you look to to figure out what a punk rock, indie style person looks like who doesn't follow anybody. Yeah? Like, all of us follow someone or something. If you won't let Jesus shepherd your heart and your soul, the world and the enemy, the flesh part of you would love to have that opportunity. Jesus wants better for you. And he wants better for the world around you, from you. Our city aches for people that are being formed into the image of Jesus, doesn't it? Even if they struggle with aspects of his message, don't you ache for that? Don't you wish you had a boss? A boss who lived with Jesus to the point she led you like Jesus was right up to the point, the surface of their character, their life, and their leadership. Don't you wish you had a roommate or neighbors? The character and the kindness of Jesus with a rightly ordered heart, with wisdom that comes from above, with eyes that could see below the, 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 the surface of a your life and the lives of people around you without shame or condemnation, with love and invitation? Don't you wish you had people in your life with supernatural ability and otherworldly kindness that was empowered and sustained by a life with him? Like our world aches. It's desperate for this. And Jesus has a plan for it. It's you. It's me. It's not to build a political platform. I'm for those. I care deeply about those. It's it's not a particular cause of of justice or an educational philosophy, social agenda. Those matter. Those matter to me. None of that matters ultimately to me. We need Christ followers in all those areas. We need Christ followers in the areas of education, politics, the nonprofit sector, people that are going into the medical community and the legal community, law enforcement community, family community. We need all of those, but we need people whose primary work, whose first work is Jesus' last words, who are living life from Jesus, with Jesus, and beginning to look like Jesus in all of the things that they do. And as we do, as we're marked as those kind of people, Jesus will do his best work in us, through us, toward the people that he's on the move towards as well. And I'm here to be a part of that. I want to beg you to jump in on it too. Would you bow your head with me? If you've never received life from Jesus, do not leave today without it. Again, at this moment would be a moment for you to tell him, I've trusted a lot of things. They didn't give me life. Today I'm putting my trust in you. I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. And I believe you offer me forgiveness, your presence, and your power to live from here forever. If that's you today, would you tell somebody, maybe before you leave today, the folks at the Next Step Center, grab me out there. I'd love to visit with you. Maybe the person that brought you. Tell somebody that you've received that gift today. Lord, I want to pray for those that are receiving the gift of everlasting life. In this moment, Lord, I want to pray for some of us who have received that gift a long, long time ago, but for whom we realize that was the last thing. That was the last step. And a long, long time ago, we received a gift from you and stopped living life from you or with you. And would you allow us over these weeks, Lord, not to be shamed, not to be condemned, but to be invited to a different kind of life. Life the way it was designed to be, true reality, alongside you, the one who sees it all, who has all authority, would you let us live life from you, learn from you what it looks like to live that life? Would you let us begin to look like you in the places that we go from here? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church slash connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.